Man like Mark Sullivan, worry yourself. Stay tuned for the chilling episode. Woo! A positive mental attitude can clear away all obstacles which stand between you and your major purpose in life. This is the Snowboard Project featuring Mark Sullivan and the Beat. The Snowboard Project. The The Snowboard snowboard project. Project. The Snowboard Project. Welcome back to the Snowboard Project. I'm Mark Sullivan. And I am the Beeve, and we are coming at you from Ketchum, Idaho, uh, from the Snowboard Project Studios. Uh, Who do we have today, Mark? So today we have our first female on the show, and it's overdue, I got to say. About time. Yeah, Yeah, about time. Overdue, right? So it's Trisha Burns, and this is a rider who I've known since I was a teenager. You know, I've been involved with snowboarding for a long time, and Trisha's been uh, involved basically the same length of time as me and so you know i was friends with her older brother we would ride at stratton and uh she was part of i guess the allegro program which was one of the first like coaching formalized Mm -hmm. coaching programs on Mm -hmm. the east coast you know before they had a program at like the stratton mountain school that has turned out so many riders she was part of this weekend program called allegro and i think it was Susie ruick was the the coach of that but guys like russell winfield were part Mm -hmm. of that and uh And Doug, her older brother. And so Matt Mitchell, the crazy Viking uh, (laughs) from the U.S. Open cage. Anyhow, um, but she went on to win the U.S. Open at the age of 16, Mm -hmm. U.S. Open women's halfpipe. She won it as like a prodigy young girl riding for Sims. Pretty cool. Now, she ended up going to the Olympics, right? She made the Olympic team. Yeah, she ended up making the Olympic team. I believe she did not make the team in 98, but then made it in 2002. And so that was a remarkable experience uh, as part of her career. Hmm. But then she's gone on to other things. She actually got a college degree while she was still riding. Hmm. And then she went on to... um, working for the the U.S. snowboard team doing PR, and more recently has taken a job at the U.S. ASA, um, showing kids kind of a, a path forward in the sport of snowboarding. All right, well, should we roll into uh, to our first female uh, interview? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do this. All right, uh, episode 17 coming at you. Trisha Burns. Okay, today I am joined by Trisha Burns. And you might not remember Trisha Burns, I certainly do, but before <laughs> there was Chloe Kim, before there was Kelly Clark, there was a different prodigy in women's half pipe riding. And that was Trisha Burns. And she, I don't know, was at the time the youngest girl to qualify for the finals at the US Open. What, like 14, Trish? Is that how old you were when you qualified for the finals? Yeah, I guess I, that was my first year at the Open. So 14, yeah. Okay, so 14 years old, you qualify for the US Open. Um, you know, what's that like? Like riding with the highest level of athletes in the world, and you're a kid basically. Yeah, it's it was amazing. Obviously, I like grew up snowboarding at Stratton and watching it as a skier. Like I think the year before I had been standing on the sidelines at the US Open and was like, I want to do that. And was and then the next year I like I'd been snowboarding a little bit, but then I really started getting into it with the crew at Stratton and it just like to be up there with people that had like traveled the world like Michelle Taggart and like those girls. It was so amazing and you know, so, I'm sure that's like everyone now. But So how long did it take you from like starting snowboarding to competing in the finals at the U.S. Open and then to start traveling the world? Like how long did that uh, it was transition take? Pretty quick. Um, I started snowboarding like spring of 88 and then 89 was my first U.S. Open. I like I fell into like the right group of people at Stratton in the winter of 88, 89. And, and then I was like, traveling in 92 so three years wow okay so i remember back then there was like a training program at stratton i think it was called allegro but you were like one of the first athletes to really kind of put some some kind of um you know some kind of regiment behind your riding beyond just going and having fun and shredding with friends you were actually training and doing stuff that maybe kids 
in like 1990 or 89 weren't really doing. Is that true? I guess. I don't know. We joined the Allegra program. It was like a weekend program at Stratton and it was run by Susie Ruick who came, who like had competed as an Alpine skier in, at SMS. So I think she just took a lot of that like mentality a little bit and brought it, but we had this fun crew and we like ran gates and like, you know, did everything like hike the half pipe and whatnot way back when. And yeah, she incorporated a lot of that sort of like mentality into it, but it it didn't feel like training, I guess. It felt like just like this posse of like hooligans, you know. And, yeah, and you said like you did every event. Like that was like slalom. Oh, yeah. Giant slalom. Half pipe. Yeah. Moguls? Did you do? No mo- moguls. Thank no God. Moguls. No moguls. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so so, but you actually excelled at the half pipe. Did you excel at racing as well, or are you more like a specialist? Let's no, say. No, I started out and I excelled at racing. Like the first year at the U.S. Open, I won like amateur slalom in like '89, and that was like what I was more skilled at straight away. Also, the half pipe was like you know they built it in like January or February, and then you competed in March, um, and. But then like, as things went on, I just really loved the half pipe and that freestyle element and racing turned into like a lot of equipment and a lot of like new, not nuance, but you know, you have to like tune your board more. I mean, now you have to do that in, in yeah, everything (laughs) you have to tune your board, you have to be on top of everything. But back then (laughs) it's like, you just wrote, you were like run what you brung. It's like, you just showed up with the board you've been riding all season and wrote it in the half pipe contest. Yeah. And then in 92, so like when I f- went to my first World Cup, I went and brought like all my Alpine gear and my half pipe stuff, and I, um, and I ended up like getting third at the half pipe event. And then the next day, I went up for slalom. I was like, oh, I just can't do it. I couldn't like bring myself to like lug all that equipment around the globe, and also it just felt way more intense. The vibe was not my scene on mm-hmm. an international level. I was just like, I just want to have fun and hike the half pipe and ride with that crew, you know? Yeah. And like back then it seemed like the Europeans were really kind of pretty focused on racing compared to the kind of loose attitude, just like everyone was having a good time doing freestyle and yeah. the racing was definitely like more regimented and serious. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what was the last race that you did? Was that the last that race? That was it. That was it? Like January, 1993. Did you sell your race gear and just? I don't know, actually. We had a pretty uh, heavy quiver at our house, so it probably just ended up in there for a a while and then maybe got sold. I don't have it now. (laughs) Yeah. Was that like hard boots or were you soft boots? Yeah, Yeah, the whole thing. I think I had like transitioned to hard boots and then I think that's when it was like, okay, like it's just so much stuff. Like I just wanted to be like carry my board, wear my boots, go. It's like two full board bags basically going with you all around the world and then you go to baggage claim and it's like, yeah, here's an 80 pound bag. Here's another 80 pound <laughs> bag. And there's my 50 pound clothes bag. How do I carry this? Totally. Yeah. Totally. Okay. So were you sponsored at this point or like, uh, yeah. how, did, how did that happen? How did that come about? So I just really lucked out. Like I, I competed in my first year in like 80, 89, had some success at the Green Mountain Series locally, like at our regional series. And then I sent this awesome sponsor me letter um, with like a list of my results to Sims out, you know, on the West Coast. And I um, got a letter back and they're like, yeah, we'll sponsor you. And which was basically the coolest thing ever. Um I probably still have that letter somewhere where it's got like the Sims, you know, logo and all their whatever. And, um, yeah, like Brad Stewart, like wrote yeah, you a Mickey letter. Keller and yeah. And Brad Stewart. Yeah. And they signed the letter. I had that on my wall. Totally. I, I wrote for Sims back then yeah. too. And it was like, I was just so stoked. And you know, I maybe got like, I don't know, like two boards a year or three boards a year, but it was like, it meant the world to yeah. me when I was like a teenager. Totally. And I got, you know, it said like Team Sims on your jacket and on your like snowboard, like they, you know, screen printed it on there or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just felt really amazing. So yeah, I wrote for them. I think I even had a travel budget. And then as um, like, and then by like 92, I started writing for Rosignol when they were in Vermont. And mm-hmm. so I was sponsored by them and yeah. You wrote for Rosniel for a long time, Yeah, right? for a long time. Yeah. Um, and until the 1998 Olympics. And then I didn't make the team and they're like, thank you, bye. 
Really? So they basically just cold dropped you when you didn't make the team? No, I mean, they were like, it's not because you didn't make the team. But, you know, when you're like, when you don't make an Olympic team, you definitely feel like, are you sure? <laughs> like, it feels like everything hinges on that. But really, they just, you know, I'm sure there are many, many they reasons. They didn't like your personality. Was, they, yeah. <laughs> I, were, I gave them many reasons to, <laughs> to yeah. can me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but you didn't stop competing there. I mean, you, no. you kept going right yeah i kind of had a rebirth after that which is awesome it's like a good breakup um but you like i after that i like kind of lost all my sponsors it felt like there was a big shift in the industry sort of like everything was like oh my god the olympics and then they kind of came and went and it just shifted i don't know if you felt that way but um but then the u.s team hit me up and they're like do you want to be on the u.s team for a while so i mean like how much do I get paid? I was like, what's in it for me? <laughs> no. Um, and then I started working with Peter Carlisle who mm -hmm. runs Octagon, you know, right. Olympic and sports division when he was just his own small enterprise. Um, and so, yeah, he started helping me build up new sponsors and I was joined the U S team and that was a whole, a whole new world for me. Wow. That's, um, that's pretty amazing that like you were able to make that transition because it must've been hard to like go from basically being sponsored, flying around the world, having everything taken care of as far as like, okay, you got expenses, I'm sure you had everything yeah. paid for. And then one day you don't make the team and then everyone tells you, no, it's not because you didn't make the team. <laughs> it's because we don't like you or whatever they said. <laughs> new direction. Yeah, new direction. Everyone's going in a new direction <laughs> after cuts. the Olympics, right? Yeah. Right. And so... Um, but you still focused on half by Friday. Yeah, I just loved it. And it was cool. Like, it just really brought it back. Um, I mean, like, granted, when I was riding for Rosinal, it's like, yes, I had travel budget and all that. But it still was, like, early days in snowboarding. You know, it's like the mid-90s. Like, you were still sort of, like, hustling. Right. You know, um, not like some of the higher paid kids today. But, um, you know, it was like you went to X Games and there was, like, 10 of you in a car, like – you know, sleeping in one hotel room or whatever, that sort of vibe was alive and well in the nineties. But then the team was like, what you get per diem, <laughs> and like, you know, travel everywhere. They book it for you and pick you up and all that jazz. Right. So you like, had to get your own rental car, yeah. carry your own baggage <laughs> yeah. through the terminal, yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So who, who was like your crew back in those early days, like in the Rossignol days, who would you ride with most and who would you kind of look up to? Um, yeah, I rode with a pretty local crew. Like, I mean, growing up, I rode with the Stratton crew, with, like my brother and Beth Trombley. And, um, and then we spent a lot of summers in Whistler. So we had sort of like Nix and Hoffy and Russell Winfield, um, Jay Fusco, that vibe. And then when I started traveling, um, for contests, you know, 93 sort of era, I ended up spending a lot of time with Jen Shirowski, Elise Sather, um, Michelle Taggart. Mm -hmm. Like I definitely looked up to Michelle Taggart and Tina Bassage and Shannon Dunn. And they were just like a little bit older than me or like old enough that you feel like they're way older than you. Um, but yeah, that's definitely like we wanted to be like them. Yeah. So, but it's funny because it's like the first group of people you mentioned, they're all guys. Yeah, yeah, and, totally. And like you, so you were basically the girl just surrounded by guys. Yeah. Was that difficult? Was that challenging to just have guys around you or did that push you to become a better I rider? Th both. I mean, like it never, I just, you know, I grew up, my brother was three years older than me. And so I just always had like a pretty heavy guy posse like in our neighborhood our friend group and i had lots of girlfriends too but i just loved to do the wild stuff that they did mm -hmm. um and so it didn't seem that weird to me or whatever but it was always trying to keep up with all the guys and like my brother and everybody and then as you start traveling like i would have have loved to have traveled with all of them too but it just ended up being like this cool girl posse and we still we had like travel with ross peterson and um greg goulet and that crew too but mm -hmm. it was more balanced definitely once we kind of hit the road yeah. so it was like the highlight of your early career like what's like the thing that you like wake up in the middle of the night like oh yeah i did that um i mean i won the us open when i was i guess 17 and that felt like it changed everything for me because i went from like being the kid who wanted to be a pro snowboarder and like be as good as those other girls were to being like oh my god i did it 
you know, like mm-hmm. I set that goal and it felt like this lofty, crazy, like no way that would be amazing if I did it. And then doing it, it kind of just makes you believe that, oh, like I've arrived or like I can do those things or mm-hmm. I'm one of them, even though you're like kind of. <laughs> Hey, what's up guys? Beef here. Uh, I know you're probably kicking back in your room with your headphones on, or maybe you're in your car on the way to work, or maybe coming from work. And I just want to say thank you for tuning in and listening. Uh, it is people like you that uh, that make this worth it for, uh, for guys like Mark and I uh, to make these episodes for you. Uh, please do us a favor. Will you please rate us, share us, tell your friends, spread the word. Uh, we want to be able to keep making this happen. Um, and if you can also go to patreon.com forward slash the snowboard project, uh, you can check us out and you can help us keep creating these uh, these podcasts for you we are an independent voice in snowboard media meaning we don't have anybody you know that we are beholden to we don't have anybody that uh that says hey you know maybe you shouldn't talk about that um and that is why this is special so thank you for being a supporter of that uh if you feel like uh supporting us or if you don't hey either way at least you're tuning in so please share please like please rate please let us know how we can be better uh patreon.com forward slash the snowboard project You set that goal, though, and you achieved that goal. And that was the biggest event in the world. That was kind of before the X Games and all of that. And it's like, now what goals did you set after? Like, how did you set another goal higher than that when you're like, I just did won the Olympics of snowboarding? Because that's what people would almost call it back then. You know, it was like the the U.S. Open was the deal. Yeah, 100%. You know, and uh, so what did you like? How did you set goals beyond that? Um, That is a really good question because I don't. I guess I just wanted to be a pro snowboarder like and travel and like compete at world cups and win world cups. I don't remember having any one specific thing other than when the Olympics became sort of a a reality in snowboarding, Mm -hmm. then I wanted to make the Olympic team and compete at the Olympics. Um, but even that, like it was such a different, like, it's so different. Like you, I know you understand because like we grew up in the same era and like know it, but you forget that people don't realize that like, wanting to be on the Olympic team or competing at the Olympics was also kind of like, not that cool. Not in the 98 yeah. Olympics, you know? No, it was like, there was a lot of sort of like, yeah, we'll see. I mean, Terry Hawkinson, you know, the best rider in the world, whatever, like bows out of it. And is kind of like anti-Olympics, anti-Olympics. And so yeah. it wasn't like it is now where I think kids are like, obviously you want to go to the Olympics. Yeah. Like then you're like, I do, but I also totally respect what we're doing here. And we're super way cooler than that. And blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like this yeah. kind of interesting balance. So when you didn't make that 98 team, were you like a little bitter towards like Barrett Christie or no. Michelle Tyre? Were you like <laughs> cat fight? I was like, heartbroken and because it was so hard then too it's like i got second place at the first olympic qualifier in maine Mm -hmm. and but then every single run of every single event counted you didn't get to throw away a single run you did you know it's like it was two runs combined no throwaway events you're like best three results out of three events so it's like you have one bad run and you're kind of like whoops there goes your like olympic dream or whatever um and you never crashed since <laughs> i've never taken a risk or fallen since that day <laughs> but um i wasn't bummed at them obviously but i was bummed at sort of like the olympic system you're like but we're the bat like there's other great riders that are great contenders that can't compete and that's still the way it is today right. but you're like, and then you go and watch the Olympics and you're like, what that person from X country that doesn't really snowboard can, is like having the opportunity you want to have. But now I see the beauty in that too. Yeah. I mean, you know, back then and, and still to some degree today, it's like America, America, we had the best <laughs> half like riders in the world. No, but we could have had like a team of like, you know, 10 people competing because like if you looked at the top 16 in any world cup or whatever it's like eight of the top 16 would be americans for both men and women maybe more you know and so we were definitely a dominant force and yet the team was what three four girls three women three women women? four women i can't remember three or four Yeah. yeah but uh but yeah i mean it was cutthroat and then the format was different as you pointed out where it was like you basically 
every contest, and I think Richard is still bitter about yeah, this. Yeah, he is. It, he's like, he has not like put that one to bed yet, but it's like, you know, it's like it's a combined format. But hey, the rules are the rules. Yeah. You knew what you were getting into. That's and if what we you wanted knew. to go to the Olympics, that was kind of the deal. Yeah. You know? And so, yeah, I mean, it's funny. How, what was it like, like going to that first Olympics, putting on that uniform, walking in the opening ceremonies at the very first? You didn't do it. I didn't right? do it. And so you watched it on TV. Were you mad? Or then it was like, was it raining for the women's event? Um, I don't remember watching opening ceremonies. I do remember watching, like being at Stratton and watching the um, Alpine event. And it looked horrific and terrible. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, God. And then I remember reading the New York Times like the following day, like because we'd been to that area in Japan before and they were sort of. Um, likening the snowboarders to monkeys, and it just didn't feel like there was a lot of love for our community. And I right, just we were remember, like a side show. yeah, you know, and it felt really lame. Not like I, I totally wanted to be there. Not like being like, oh, it looked lame because I didn't go. But like, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I just was really sort of like disappointed in the experience. You know, like we were so cool, and they were treating us like we weren't. <laughs> yeah. And then Ross Rebegliati. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, saved, he saved it for everyone, right? <laughs> right. And then everyone's talking about that. That's true. That's so funny. Yeah. I mean, that was pretty funny. And he never gave the medal back. That was also like another controversy. So they wanted to take the medal yeah. from him. And he was like, he like took off or disappeared. <laughs> and I don't know what happened. But it was just like kind of le a legendary story. That was probably the most legendary thing in the snowboarding from the first Olympics. Totally. So, although I still see John Simmons, you know, he's a yeah, great guy. Love and like, that guy. And he's just like, yeah, I kind of lucked out, you know, yeah. maybe Richard should have won. I don't know, yeah. but, he did. but it was a hey, combined format. Yeah. And so it was like, a little bit more luck involved, maybe, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's always feels like, especially at the Olympics, there's like this level of like, what? Like yeah. luck or, or whatnot. Um, yeah. But. So did you end up going to the Olympics in 2002? Did you make that team? I did make that team. <laughs> you were like, I'm not not making this team again. Was the format changed then? Was it like best of format by then? Or was it like combined still? Yeah, no. So 2002, a lot of things had changed like in four years. Um, it was best of like still an interesting format to make the finals. But, um, but yeah, best of two. And the world was like ready for snowboarding and yeah. it was in the U S and it just felt like there was so much positive energy going into the Olympics around the snowboarding team. Um, and it was after nine 11. So there's just a lot of like, you know, national pride and sort of like outpouring of awesome energy and love like yeah. for that. Um, yeah. I remember being at the, uh, um, like after a press conference and like this, I have took this photo of Danny Cass and he's just surrounded by this like swarm of like, you know, uninformed reporters, like taking in every single word of his, like, what, what is he saying? You know, was, was he wearing like that beret at the time? <laughs> I think he had on like some sort of roots attire, but the beret was only for, you know, um, special occasions, opening ceremonies and looking like a super dork. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and closing ceremonies. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of funny because it's like, how did you feel when they're like, they're like, you know, I mean, you had like a sense of style that was like true to snowboarding and right. they give you like this, okay, here's, what you're gonna wear yeah and they tell you here's what you're gonna wear and they give you this like fleece beret and like just this kind of to snowboarders it was not authentic i'll put it yeah. nicely that way yeah right but uh what was it like when you like look over and there's danny cass wearing a raspberry beret oh my gosh <laughs> it was hysterical the photos are amazing also because everyone's like all right, you're so psyched to be there. You're like, I've never been more excited to wear the most heinous headwear <laughs> ever. <laughs> and then you see people buying it in the streets and you're like, oh my God, no. Um, but yeah, it's like, that. that's the funny and cool part about the Olympics. It's like you get this whack outfit and everyone just like embraces it like it's cool for a minute. Or they do now. Like I definitely during the 2002 Olympics, it was like, you had to wear something of the attire like at all times. And so I just would wear the scarf, just one scarf. Like, so you got to kind of your own style. Yeah. Or just like, I'm like, please, I'm not wearing polo shirts and like pleated pants with, you know, boots. Yeah. Did some, did some people on that team like go head to toe all the time? Um, I don't remember anyone doing that, but I do remember people being psyched about certain items in the, in the yeah. attire, you know, you're a dork. 
<laughs> super, super judgy. Yeah. Like, oh, well, you were young back then. Like, how old were you when you went to that? 12. Just well, kidding. <laughs> I was 27. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. So what was it like, you know, walking in the opening ceremonies? Did That's when it like hit you like this is like the real deal? Or when did you kind of realize when you made the team? When did it kind of sink in that like, wow, this is something pretty big? Yeah, I think walking in, like there's so much hype around it and so much energy spent. It's like the most stressful. It's way more stressful to make the Olympic team than it is to be on the Olympic team or compete at the Olympics Mm -hmm. because it's such a nail biter. Like everyone's having mental, like not everyone, but a lot of people are just just like cracking and there's so much pressure from parents and people like come out of the woodwork like you're gonna make the team and you're like ah i've got two events left or whatever um and it it was right your sponsors are like you know what happened four years ago (laughs) (laughs) you got a lot on the line lady um but yeah so then like making the team you're just like okay there's like it's kind of bittersweet like gretchen blyler and i who are like really good friends it came down to the last spot i got it she didn't get it it was like very heartbreaking because like i wanted to share the olympic experience with her and kelly and like people that we've been like traveling and training and like living together and 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 here it is it came down to the two of us and it was pretty gnarly and so i just was like okay i'm gonna have the best time ever because it was such a like heartache to get here and but then like walking into the opening ceremonies it's like it feels 100 percent real or even just going to the venue and you see these stands bigger than anything you've ever seen and you're Mm -hmm. like people are gonna sit in those and watch us snowboard like it's it's normal now but it was mind-blowing then um But yeah, the moment that it felt super real was when they're like, let the games begin. I just remember being like, don't get hurt. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So like that was the biggest audience you'd ever snowboard in front of. What was going through your head when you're like at the top of the pipe and it's like competition day and you're qualifying for the finals? I mean, was it, did you have to like find a new gear to like, to like focus or how did that, how did that go mentally when you're really like doing something that had never been done as far as audience pressure all of that in snowboarding yeah um mentally i just was like sort of i took that same vibe of like i just want to have the most fun ever i want to land my tricks and just enjoy the day because i'd seen people in 1998 that had come out of the olympic experience they had like left early or just didn't enjoy it and were really bummed and then they they were like in hindsight, they wish they'd enjoyed the experience of it instead of just being there to like win their medal or do their one thing. Right. You're um, always an Olympian. Yeah. They tell you that, right? <laughs> Never former. Always. Yeah. Uh, who got the, um, what, Ron, no, who's the guy, the half pipe guy from 98, Ron Quixote. Oh, yeah. You got like the tattoos, like I'm always an Olympian. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everyone seems to get tattoos of the Olympic rings. I did not. Yeah. Um, do you have to get that like approved by the IOC? Yeah, you right. Get the tattoo. You go to a Portland tattoo shop over here. You're and, like, oh, we own a piece of that, actually. Yeah, you got to give us royalties every time you <laughs> you go get in a bathing suit. You have to. <laughs> totally. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what I was saying or what we're talking about other than. Just like the pressure of like, oh, yeah. uh, like the competing and like. Being in front of 25,000 people on your home soil. It's not like Japan where no one speaks English or yeah. something and it's raining or whatever. But it's like this is that in Salt Lake City in front of your home crowd. Yeah. You're representing America. Yeah. And uh, But you just focused on having a good time. I mean, I know that sounds so cliche, especially now. But it really was just like I am going to have the most fun ever. And the energy of the crowd was it wasn't like a snowboarding event, like the open, which is super awesome energy where it's like people are cheering. They know their fans are like back in the day that like knew all the people and like. Here, That's like drunk energy. That's not. Yeah, it's <laughs> very different. <laughs> totally um, different things. But like at the Olympics, it was people that had never seen it, or they were new to it, or they heard about it, or whatever. But it was it was awesome, and I just remember feeling like standing at the top, and um, Sabina Van Hasla from Germany dropped in. She was the first person to go, and the crowd, the sound of the crowd was so powerful. They're like you know, dropping in first from Germany, and it was like, Brah! like oh my gosh, when. The first American comes, it's going to be, you know, double that or right. whatever. Um, and it just hyped me up so much. I was like, okay, I'm going so to have that, the that most fun. Fend your energy. Yeah. That give you more energy. Yeah. There's no well, fun being stressed out when okay, people so are what was the highlight of like that Olympic experience? I mean, you went through the whole thing, competed. What was the best part? Yeah. For snowboarding part, it was definitely like I'd been, I'd learned McTwist that summer. 
Um, and I'd landed a bunch of them and then I just could not put my feet down at all. And I'd been crashing and I hadn't landed one in a while since like qualifiers probably. And I like smashed my face during practice at the Olympics. Um, and then it was like the final, like finals or whatever. And I'm like, okay, it's it's like do or die. And I landed my McTwist on my second run. I'd fallen on my first run, looked up at the Jumbotron. I was like, I can see exactly what I'm doing wrong. And I went up there and at the bottom, I talked to my coach, um, Heath Van Aken. He's like, you got this, you got to do it. Like it's now or never. And I was like, yes. And then I got myself so psyched on the way up. And then I got to the top and I talked to like the other coach, Pete Del Giudice, And he was like, do not do that. Just play it safe. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> this is like before radio communication or something. Right. <laughs> I'm like, oh my. Mixed signals. <laughs> totally. So then I just like, I was like, I came here to do this trick, you know, like I've learned this and whatever. And so I went out there and landed it on my second run and it was awesome. It was like so fulfilling to like do that and like, and feel rewarded and in all the work and, you know, like, like that Hail Mary moment that like actually comes true. Um, that was like my best competing moment. Cool. There. Yeah. So, and then, um, you know, it seems like right after that snowboarding change, just because of the men's sweep, you yeah, know, not to diminish anything from awesome. the women, Kelly Clark, amazing, right? Yeah. But it's like the men swept and that really, for the first time since 1956, like men swept at a Winter Olympic event for the United States. And that really, to me, that's when like the corporate sponsors started lining up. Did you take advantage of that? Were you like, as being an Olympian in 2002 on that team, did you have like a few extra corporate sponsors and you also had an agent? Yeah. Peter Carlisle, who kind of knew those people. Yeah, I think going into the games, we got a lot of maybe I can't remember when it was or um, but like I remember doing like autograph signings for Office Depot and things like that, like mm-hmm. sort of like Olympic sponsors. I think that was pre pre the games. Um, and then post. Yeah, it just felt like everybody wanted a piece of it. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't remember if I took advantage of it. I'm sure that I did. Yeah. <laughs> But you still have those sponsors to this day, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. <I'm laughs> the long-lasting relationship. AT&T or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. But it was awesome to see that and to be a part of that team that was like like record. Like when Kelly won her medal, it really like teed it up for everyone else. Like It mm-hmm. felt like the guys were like, all right, let's do this. And I just remember watching them and they were so psyched. And there's such great riding. And like Ross was not the shoe-in to win that. And he wasn't even riding that well you know, going into the, into Mm -hmm. the like finals or whatnot. And then he just like turned it on. It was amazing. And Danny and JJ and yeah, it was cool to see. And then cool to see their sort of sweep energy afterwards. Yeah. And you know, I mean, there's also the guys who got fourth and fifth and sixth who wanted to be, I know. Uh, Yeah. That was, that was rough for those guys because it was, um, it was interesting if you were there and knew all those guys yeah. and just saw, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of different being on the inside, being on the yeah. team and like knowing the personalities and the people and how they take the win and the loss yeah. and whatever. What was like, uh, what was the hardest part about the Olympics for you? Like, as far as like, it wasn't all, you know, yeah. unicorns and rainbows. So it, was there any downside to it? Um, I just remember feeling like I wish I had known going into it that if you don't win a medal, no one cares. <laughs> you mean they don't care about you or like, or like. It's kind of like, like, I just thought, I just realized how much winning a medal is, it's like when you think about making the Olympics or being a part of the team, I bought into the idea of it being like all about the experience and like being an Olympian and ambassador for your sport and your country and all that stuff. But then really like the media, like even, you know, other Olympics, I've seen people win like silver or bronze and they're like, Oh, but a figure skater won gold. So shoo along, you know, or whatever. Like it really becomes a lot about like just people saying like, Oh, you made the Olympics. Did you win a medal? Like those, that's sort of the line of questioning. So I think that was, that was really interesting for me. And, um, and maybe the hardest part is that you're like, oh, I wish I had like tried a little harder <laughs> or like, <laughs> you know, whatever. But then like you also mentioned, um, you know, watching people get fourth place when like it's always, you know, we, we work in a subjective environment and it's like, 
you, you know, are we dealing with style over progression? Like those are the like right. age old questions of snowboarding. And, and I saw like firsthand when JJ landed his run and he kind of like sketched and he got up and he like took his bib off and like threw it in sort of like disbelief and frustration that like, oh, I just blew it. And then the scores come up and he's like, maybe I should grab that bib because it looks like I'm on the podium. You know, right. like there's that thing's going to be worth something on eBay one day. <laughs> Wait, I'm getting third place. Okay. Yeah. Um, th- so just like the nuances and sort of the power and the like energy that the Olympics and the media and everyone puts on like gold, gold, gold. And the medal counts for like, mm-hmm. you know, U S ski and snowboard team. It's all about like, which nation is leading in the medal count when, you know, I feel like, when you grow up looking at the Olympic movement, you're thinking of like these amazing stories and these people that have persevered or whatever, all that sort of thing that you're not like, I didn't really always buy into like gold medal, gold medal, gold medal, like adding them up, tallying them. But that's the thing is you learn through the process. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, uh, you know, it's to some degree, it's kind of made for TV. Of course. And you realize that when you're on the reality TV show, but up until you're on it, you're kind of like, oh, I totally thought this wasn't staged. (laughs) (laughs) I thought The Bachelor really people did fall in love. (laughs) Yeah. Then you met Jesse Sisnick. And it's true. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) totally. Don't forget to support advertising free snowboarding media at patreon.com. The Snowboard Project. The The Snowboard snowboard project. Project. The Snowboard Project. Okay, so, and then you you kept competing though after that, right? You had, uh, yeah. how long did you compete for? For so long. Um, I competed until 2009. Wow. So. Did you make the 2016? No. I, <laughs> no. I also did not make the 2016. So you've got some, some you know, some <laughs> ups, some downs, some downs, ups, downs. Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's the other funny thing about like making the team. Like you're like, oh yeah, next time. And I've seen so many people do it like. You're like, oh, it's not just a guarantee that in four years you're going to be the top three or four riders in the nation, you know? Um, And, you know, I feel like I watched kind of Louis Vito go through that or other people that Mm -hmm. like still compete and then they just like don't make the team again. And you're like, oh, but this time I was going to do it right, you know, or whatever. Yeah. You don't get your rebate necessarily. Yeah. Um, But I just love snowboarding and the community and traveling and competing in the, the circuit, like, I don't feel like I'm like that competitive of a person, but I just loved being a part of that world and the friend group and progression right. and all that stuff. So what were like the the highlights? You had a career that spanned 20, 20 years. years. 20 years of standing on top of podiums <laughs> around the world, Trisha Burns. 20 years What, what are the highlights shit. of that? Um Oh my God. So many, I mean, the Olympics were, was a highlight. The winning the US open was a highlight, like in terms of like, you know, career box checking, but just being able to be a part of the growth of snowboarding really like that's overarching, but that like, I don't know, just, I felt like I watched so many people come and go in the industry and it was awesome to be a part of all those like posses of people like outlast everybody yeah i mean like <laughs> it sounds lame. i'm a survivor yeah or just go from being like like you said like it came in i was 14 i was like traveling with all these like 19 year old dudes and living in whistler and like living in the house with like terry hawkinson and like you know greg manning whatever all these like nut jobs and like fun fun times as a teen and then like going and being like the oldest person on the team with traveling with like 14 year old Hannah Teeter and like, Mm -hmm. you know, just being on both sides of it was really um, cool. And the perspective of just, I just felt really lucky to be in it for as long as I was. Mm -hmm. So what, so when you started mentoring like Kelly Clark and Hannah Teeter, they looked up to you, right? I don't know. I think they did. (laughs) I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say they looked up to you. So what kind of advice did you kind of give them? What kind of sage wisdom were you passing on to the next generation when you were doing that? Man, that's a good question. I don't know if I gave them any sage wisdom, but I just tried to keep it fun and like community like create community, include everyone. Cause I feel like when you're traveling on the team and you're competing with everyone, you're kind of like, you're in it, you know, you're, 
you're like, oh, that person just beat me or I just beat that person or whatever there. And you're like in the van and it's awesome. But um, like, I think now a lot of people sort of like segment themselves off. Like you see like a posse of like one athlete and like so many people surrounding them Mm -hmm. that I just try to keep us as a collective group, like going all out to dinner together and like just working together as as a community because it made it more fun. Yeah. And family. And like, that's the one thing I tried to like, not like give them wisdom on, but just create a space for them. And it was hard too. Sometimes I'm just like, I'm so much older than these kids and I'm having to like room with them. And I just want to be like, ah, you know? Right. Yeah. (laughs) Cause it's like you're 30 and they're 15 and you're like, we have some things in common, like going left and right. Yeah. But basically, I want to read a book and you want to jam out to tunes. Yeah, and go or watch cartoons. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I just tried to create that. I don't know if I gave them any advice or whatnot, but also just like, I'm sure advice came along the way, good probably and bad. But um, but yeah, just like, this is our crew and we're really lucky to be a part of it and let's cultivate it. Are you still friends with a lot of those people that yeah. you traveled with? Yeah. For sure. Are you not friends with any of them? Is there anyone who like like rubbed everyone the wrong way and was like, geez, with this person is going to travel with this all year long? Were there um, any people like that? I think is people- that part of, Is that part of making the team is like getting along with people, your people skills as well as your- No, you just, if you are- Good enough. Like tick all the boxes. Yeah, you get- Okay, so but, is there anyone like that? You don't have to mention any names. No, but I think a lot of people come in like that where you're just like, oh my God, you know- um, like for everyone or whatever, or there's like, oh, they're coming in. It's hard to come onto the team. I came onto the team and it's like, feels like a click and you're like back in high school and you're like, why am I not being invited to dinner? You know, or whatever, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, and so there's like that whole level, but it's, um, and definitely people are like, can you believe what they said or what, you know, whatever, but right. you just, it's like your family, like my family and I are not. Um, we're not all alike and we have very differing views on a lot of things. And yet we all can hang out together and enjoy, you know, space and common good. And it's like that. Yeah. Okay. So every year you you get a new younger sister. Every year you get a new (laughs) younger sister. Never an older sister, always a younger sister. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Around 2009, you kind of stopped competing. What did you do? Like, what was your first move after competing? Like, what did you do yeah. from there? So in 2006, I, I didn't make the Olympic team. And I, um, but I went to the Olympics and watched. And I just wanted to be there because it's awesome. Because free trip to Italy is pretty sweet. Yeah, and I had some, some work to do there. Um, no, but I... And it's just like, this is my, these are my friends. This is my community. I want to support yeah. them. You know, like Gretchen made the t- her first Olympic team and, um, and I just wanted to be there and like watch it go down instead of like being a spectator from afar. So I went over there and I spent a lot of time with the Octagon crew. Um, mm-hmm. and so after 2006, um, Peter Carlisle was like, when you're done, I'd love to like invest in you and bring you on as, some part of our team. Um, Mm -hmm. So I started working for Octagon probably in like 2007 or eight as a client manager while still competing. Um, Client manager, the client being the- Athletes. The athletes. So you were kind of the intermediary between the sponsor and the athlete. Yeah, bringing on new clients, um, finding new talent and that sort of thing. So I did that with Octagon, which is so cool because I, was, he's like, still compete, still be out there, do your thing. But um, yeah, so I helped like manage Kelly actually. <laughs> really? So what were some of the things that you had to learn? Like, I mean, it's one thing to be an athlete and um, yeah. trying to get sponsored there, but now you're kind of trying to represent both the athlete and the sponsor. What kind of new things were you learning doing that? Oh, it was so eye-opening. Like, I felt like I had a good grasp that, that as an athlete, you're a marketing tool. Like, I'd been in the business long enough to know that, like, it's not always personal and that, you know, if you're not selling product, they can't justify necessarily paying you just because you're good at something, which I think is a hard lesson for a lot of athletes to learn. And so I, I, I kind of understood that being in the industry for so long, but then it just became very clear and also very clear that like the deal you get is like, it's not a matter of like how good you are or what you're worth. It's just like what you can negotiate. Those were two sort mm-hmm. of eye opening things because I got to see sort of behind the curtain and look at like monster, for example, there were like seven athletes 
you know, that worked with Octagon that all had monster deals mm. that came in at different times. And you're like, that is not like looking at the athlete and their skill set and whatever. And then looking at their price tag, it was so all over the place, you know, right. like some of them had come in with a bad monster deal already or whatever, but it was that sort of stuff was eye opening. And then just being on the negotiating side of the industry and learning, yeah, just how that works and it felt like a little bit disheartening because you're like selling people, you know, yeah. like. Did you feel like, I mean, I've kind of seen it just with like the marketing of women snowboarding in particular, but what I call like the Roxy factor, which is like, you know, oh, yeah. it's like not just your skill on the snowboard, your ability to win that matters. Whereas with the guys, it's like you can, you know, you can look whatever you can yeah. have whatever personality if you're winning that that's enough for a sponsor whereas with the girls it seems like to me and i could be wrong but it's like looks are almost taken into consideration 100 percent, they are huh yeah how did that make you feel like, terrible terrible always but like i'd been in the industry long enough i mean i grew up in an era where black fly was sponsoring <laughs> You were sponsored by Black Flies? No, but that? like, I just remember swat looking at or like board ads where women are like straddling snowboards and like that's their coverage in the magazine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's like, yes, we lived in a different world, but that was terrible. And it felt like you have to be 10 things. You have to be good at everything. You have to be a competitor, a backcountry rider. You also have to be like cute and good looking. And then you have to do your hair and makeup. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Right. And like... I also felt growing up, it's like people that were like dating certain people got different advantages, you know, whatever, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so to be on that side, and it's true, like I've had very frank conversations with people like on the other, you know, on this side of the industry or whatever. And it's like, well, and she's cute. And you're like, ah, like, when are we going to just move away from that? Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, but you, you should hear her personality. She's a great person. Yeah. Or, something or like that. they have a great skill set and they're a great role model, whatever. Like we yeah. can market them in this way. But instead, it's like an Instagram these days, you know, it's like all these butt shots and all that stuff going down. It's just like, oh, I, no. I haven't checked your Instagram account. Really. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen my, but like, it's just, we're just, per, it's just, it's, carrying on you know yeah. and it's perpetuating yeah. it's almost like ramping up because of this like instant gratification yeah. or instant instagram yeah. or whatever um but yeah that was that's always been a hard pill to swallow on the, uh, as a female snowboarder right. is that sort of like or anything you know like that sort of level of that your um it's looks like matter you yeah know? Totally. And um, okay, so so do you think that that's something that can be overcome? Is there any way to combat that, or is that just like part of the Q score, or you know, that's just part of the deal, and you have to accept it? Um, I would love to say that we could overcome it. I just don't know. I mean, I'm looking at like in you know surf, skate, snow, all that stuff. It's like. Um, surfer slash model, like we're just, and especially with brand influencers. And if you have 50,000 followers or whatever, 150, 200 million followers, and you're, you're not as good as someone else, but you are, you know, yeah, working that angle, then they're going to work with you. You right. know? I mean, I'd say that there are girl snowboarders who are like, not necessarily ending up on the podium, but yet they probably have some of the most lucrative deals yes. in the sport. Based you know? on that, yeah. 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 And so they spend maybe, they focus more of their time in the mirror and less of their time, you know, crashing in the half pipe or wherever, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I'm not really pointing a finger at anyone in particular, but I would say that there are girls who like are known for their attractiveness and not for their cutting edge performances. Yeah, definitely. Know? And it's like, yeah, that's our world, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I so, don't know. What are your thoughts? I, I, my, well, my <laughs> thoughts are, I mean, I, I think it's a, I think that that is a reality that, that has been handed to us, Yeah. you know? And so, and you know, it's like, I'm a guy, I know when I see an attractive girl, I kind of do a double take or yeah. whatever, but it's like, that's just kind of the sub program. But by the same token, it's like, you know, you want the performance to matter. And it's like, if girls are selling stuff to girls, then being a role model should be important and being like a good person should be important. Yeah. And it's like, well, are girls who are being objectified, are they selling product to guys? 
you know? Yeah. Or, or are they just selling product to girls? Or right. Is it, or, or what lesson is that teaching girls is like, no, you better also like really focus on how you look and like, no, you're going to be an object whether you like it or not. It's like yeah. what kind of role modelship is that, you know? Yeah. It's very, it's confusing in, yeah. because like, yeah, they're, they're like making money doing their thing and they're getting to support and do what they love and extend their careers and that sort of thing. It's just like, and I get it. It's like, go, go for it, you know, own your body and like no shame, you know, whatever. But it's just very, it's interesting. It would be interesting to see, like you're saying, like, who are they actually reaching on that? Yeah. Because it's like, I don't, I don't think that I've ever like, and you know, maybe I'm just old school, but it's like, I don't, I don't look at like, uh, you know, like, a a girl riding a board and I'm, even if she's cute, I'm not like, wow, that's the board for me. Yeah. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm just like, okay, she's cute, cool, whatever. But it, it doesn't mean that like, she's being a brand influencer over me in the same way that she could be to girls who look up to her and they're like, I want to walk a mile in her shoes one right. day. But you're yeah. like double tap. <laughs> <laughs> What, what, what's going on over there, Beef? I'm just angry. Why, why are you so angry? I'm just an angry snowboarder. Oh, come on, Beef. You're not that angry. I'm, we should have called Kinger and, and have him cheer you up. <laughs> or better yet, we should just look at our Patreon page and see right. if anyone is supporting us this right. month. Yeah, no, let's get stoked on snowboarding. Yeah, right? I'm actually all yeah. stoked all the let's time. Let's get stoked all the time. On snowboarding. Yeah. And you know how we're going to do that? By not being angry. No, no, we're going to do it by telling the real oh, stories of snowboarding gotcha, and not gotcha. having advertisers uh, influencing us. And so normally like in magazines and like social media, mm -hmm. there's advertisers, people like Burton or LibTech right, or whatever. Right. But like part of the message then that you're conveying is their message. And you're kind of like right. carrying the, the water for these brands. And so we don't have to carry the water for anyone. I'll carry nope. your water, I guess, Beef. You already did earlier today. Yeah, well, you're welcome. Yeah, no problem. So go to patreon.com slash slash the snowboard project we have different levels are outlined there on our patreon page please support this independent voice in snowboarding media uh, where, where was i going with this anyway okay so you work for octagon yeah. right what were, okay so what were some of like the Okay, we talked about that. Okay, where, where, where did you go from Octagon? Because I know you moved to Aspen. Oh, yeah. So moved I moved to Aspen, to Aspen in 2000 and I don't know, four or five. Okay, so you lived there for a while. Yeah, and um, I love Aspen. It's the best place on the planet. Um, and I just, Free tickets coming your way? No, it just, I don't know. I never thought I would live there. And then I moved there and it just like opened up my snowboarding just in a new capacity. I really like explored the mountain. I love the, you know, just. No one looked at you funny when you wore your mink jacket. You can wear whatever you wanted. <laughs> it was a lot like New York City. You're like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, or but Portland for that matter. Yeah, totally. <laughs> in a different kind in of different, way. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah. And then I also, so when I was working for Octagon, I sort of branched i was helping connect this company called go to 11 and mm -hmm. they were coming on as sort of a social media um for action sports athletes and um i brought uh jeff greenwood to he helped me out with do some video stuff video content for them and then we we worked together to develop sort of their webcasting platform mm -hmm. and so then we um, started webcasting all of the Burton U.S. Opens and the U.S. Open of Surf and all these events. Um, and my life sort of shifted that way. I started doing, a, I, I left Octagon and started working for Go to 11 full time and just started traveling and working in the industry as like media and yeah. creating uh, webcasts. Cool. Did you have a background in webcasts? No. No one did, right? That was like at the beginning of it. But you did, you did. And I got to say, like, you're one of the only successful pro athletes who actually went to college, right? You got a college That's degree. That's right. Yeah. A real, real genuine four a year real college. degree. What From, was your degree in? Um, I studied psychology and English. So I double majored and I loved college. Really? Yeah. So 
how did you balance being like a pro athlete competing around the world and then and double majoring and you know <laughs> two useless degrees no um i it was a really good perspective shift for me because i felt like i couldn't have hung in the um snowboarding world like 24 7 all year round and so mm -hmm. i would compete i would go to school from you know august until december the first week in december take all my exams like a week or two early and then um started traveling and doing world cups and whatnot and then go to summer camp you know up at mount hood or whatever in the summertime and then finish up in like mid-july and do a summer semester at school and then back into it and it it just really helped me have other friends that didn't snowboard um and weren't all consumed in this one one world where you're like everything feels so important and snowboard 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 and then i would go back to college and it's like none of my friends i mean i had a lot of friends at college that went for snowboarders and pro snowboarders but i had a lot of friends that just had a regular existence that like focused on mm -hmm. school and whatever you do in college. So how long did it take you to get a four year degree? I'm assuming more than four years. Four and a half years. Wow. So, so I you... finished in the fall after my classmates graduated and then I had like one other credit. So whatever, five years. But then you pretty much are like, okay, check that box back to snowboarding. Yeah, a hundred percent. So I graduated in 96 or seven mm -hmm. and then yeah, it was full throttle so snowboard. did you did you start using that degree with go to 11 or at octagon did you use some of the things you had actually studied in school and use that as part of what you were yeah. doing for work yeah as an english major i felt like i could write some really good emails <laughs> 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 um yes and no i mean like not directly but i do feel like getting a college education it just makes you eat, like you can articulate your thoughts better, like arguments, what whatnot. Um, a lot of arguments in your personal life. <laughs> or just, you know, like your point of view, yeah. I guess, not argument. But, but you could also show that you had like the diligence to show up and do, yeah. like go through all the steps, whether you like it or not. Yeah. I'm sure like in college, I know I went to college and it was like, I didn't like everything I did at yeah. college, but I did it and I, <laughs> I, I got good grades. Even the stuff I hated, I still got good grades, yeah. at, you know? And I just, I, yeah, it taught me a lot about, I mean, if I came out of high school, I just, it gave me a lot more confidence mm -hmm. um, in academics and yeah. And then I loved, I, I learned that I like, like to write and I like to do that sort of thing. So it definitely helped with Go to Love and I was writing articles or just blogs or whatnot and writing for magazines here mm -hmm. and there about snowboarding or whatnot. Um, and yeah, so I don't feel like it directly translated from like, you know, the education I got to a career path I'm in, but I have learned a lot from that. Right. So, yeah. So what do you do today? Like what keeps you busy on a day-to-day -day basis today besides fixing up this beautiful house? <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. So now I still work in snowboarding. I just haven't been able to like get out of the industry um, in a good way. I'm not like trapped or anything, but I <laughs> <laughs> you painted yourself into a corner. <laughs> yeah. I'm always, I think when you're in snowboarding and you're an athlete, you're like, when I get out and I've talked to so many of my friends that have like left the industry and they're like, I just want to like, you know, have a consistent job and work nine to five. And they work for like one year and they're like, oh my God, no, I can never do that again. You know, it's so yeah. like, the idea is sort of alluring. You're like, oh, community, you know, like, you know what's coming next. Like, you're going to have a steady paycheck or whatever, like, as people are starting to, like, lose sponsors at the right. end. And, like, you're not going to be judged every single weekend on, like, how you rode or whatnot. And then they get out in the world and they're like, dude, we had it so good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, so I now I work for USASA, which is the grassroots snowboarding organization. It's like the amateur snowboard yeah. series, like regional events, like in... Yeah. I don't know, Intermountain West would be my region, yeah. right, for my kids. Exactly. Yeah, so there's 32 regions around the country, and um, that's sort of like where everyone starts for the Olympics or whatnot. Like, if you yeah. want to find a community in snowboarding, um, you start there. And, like, I think every single Olympian since, like, 2006 came through USASA and probably 90% before that. Um and so what do you do so for the for them, ASA, ASA? <laughs> I do um, marketing, social, anything they need, uh, business partnerships, relationships, and cool. yeah, and just do that part time. And then the rest of the time I do, um, you know, sort of production work for X Games and whatever sort of fun things come down my 
Well, I'm sure you have to to um, pursue these jobs. They don't just fall in your lap, or do they fall in your lap? Because you're like, did you see the Olympics in 2002? Because you know I who I am. Just open up to the universe, and everything just like comes to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I I like things fall in my lap for sure, and then I put myself out there and like you know pitch so, pitch projects. Ideas. So what's like the hardest part of you know having a career being like going like traveling the world for years and years and then now it's like you have responsibility what's the hardest part of that like being a grown-up yeah what's the hardest part of being a grown-up <laughs> i wouldn't know i'm sorry i know i don't know if i'm gonna know yet um i don't know the hardest part is feeling like i guess the hardest part would be um loving the freedom that being a snowboarder you know, has awarded a lot of us, um, to feeling like to try to fit into like a nine to five peg or whatever. Not that I fit into that, but I'm always like, Oh, I could be something bigger if I could just follow the regular path, but like, I can't bring myself to do it. So. Yeah. You get pretty used to, um, pursuing your dreams. You know, it seems yeah. like you've always done something that you're passionate about and with the USASA because you came from that background as well. It's yeah. like you can kind of maybe see a little piece of yourself in some 14 year old girls from the, uh, the mid upper Midwest region yeah. or whatever. Or you, you just know. like you go, there's something so awesome. I mean, we love snowboarding. That's why we're, we are in it and do it, but it's still so cool to see the spark that is still alive because of pe like in these next generation of kids because of snowboarding and the community and the fun and kind of like what we've built. So I love being a part of that. And it's hard to like walk away from that and just hustle product or something. Yeah. Do you, do you go to like the nationals or do you go to a lot of regional events? No, I go to a couple of regional events, but I go to nationals. I hadn't been in years. Like I went to the nationals in 1992 and that was my last one as a competitor. And then I went back a couple of years later, um, a couple of years ago, I mean, and it is like almost like brings tears to your eyes. You're like, oh my gosh, like these kids are so stoked. They love snowboarding so much. And like, it's so important to them and feels so big. And it feels like, like they are walking in, they, there's like an opening ceremonies at nationals where everybody comes out with their series and they have the same sort of like energy that walking into the like Olympics kind of felt like, really? like for them, like it feels that huge. And this year we brought back a lot of the Olympians, like Kyle Mack, who got a silver medal, um, this winter. And he was like, I remember nationals feeling like the way nationals feel felt to me as a kid is what going to the U S open feels like now. Like, so it was just cool to or see that. Olympics. Yeah. Or winning a silver medal in the Olympics, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, it was cool to see that, um, spark and it's sometimes you, you don't see it at the higher level events. Yeah. It seems like, um, it's easy to set expectations to yourself that you can never achieve. Did you ever do that? Did you ever, you know, have these expectations? Like you set a goal and that really you were never able to attain that goal or have you, have you um, mostly achieved kind of the goals that you set in front of yourself? No. Um, I mean, I wanted to make those Olympic teams and definitely right. didn't make those. That was like a hard pill to swallow, but it was, like, you know, great things came out of it. Um, right. So you learned some lessons. Yeah. Your failures were also your successes. Yeah, or the, or the seed planted for success. Or later. like the door opened in a different way. Like I felt like if I had made that 2016, I probably, I mean, maybe I would have worked for Octagon, but it just felt like th that experience came out of that of not making the team. But um, yeah, or tricks I thought I would land like 100% and just never, ever got them back or put them to my feet, you know, yeah. like, and you're like visualizing, like doing all the things, like eating all the foods or whatever. And you're just like, <laughs> I <"Hey."> ate <laughs> 10 pounds of kale last week. Why can't I land this with a twist? Oh yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, I'm just a head case. Yeah. Well, I mean, so what kind of advice do you have for like kids that who have that spark who are like 13, 14 years old and they're at the nationals? And they're like, wow, you're Trish Burns. Yeah, they're wow. like, what? <laughs> Where's my sticker? Um, I mean, it's the same advice. It's cliche, but just like do it for the right reasons and because you love it and because it's fun and it's not about winning. Um, I mean, it feels good to do that and achieve goals and set goals and like take them off the box, but just like focus on the fun. I feel like there's so much more energy around our sport now that's like 
not just about like going out there and riding with your friends and being good people and good community members. It's like the Olympics, the money, the fame, like all this perceived stuff. And there's a lot of external hustle from parents and coaches and whoever, you know, I just feel like we got to focus on the good times because it's super precious. And, you know, we're, we've been lucky enough to like enjoy it for a long, long, long time, but yeah. Yeah. It seems like, yeah, there's a lot of, um, parents and coaches who maybe are actually planting the seeds of unrealistic expectations, you know, instead of like the kids just enjoying it. It's like at a certain point it like, you know, the fun was only part of it. And then it, and the, the success was also a part of it, you know? And, and really it's like the success is actually a byproduct of fun. Maybe still. Yeah. Hopefully. (laughs) Hopefully so. Okay. So what are you going to be doing in 10 years? Let's wrap this thing up. Where where are you going to be in 10 years? You're going to have like six kids and, and, uh, and, and, um, four USSA, ASA champions. uh, Oh my God. Um, that is a great question. The future will be determined. I have no idea. I mean, I'm like chugging along and like still, I feel like there'll always be a part of me that is active in snowboarding and in this community. I just love the people too much and the, and the activity of doing it and what it brings about. But, um, I don't know. I don't have any, is it bad? I don't have any hard goals. Maybe I should come up I with don't them. Know. What did they teach you in college? You should talk to <laughs> Tony Robbins. Um, okay. So, <laughs> so now that you've been, um, a snowboarder, let's say for a majority of your life, a vast majority of your mm-hmm. life, tell me final question. Tell me about the best day ever snowboarding. Oh, your favorite day ever. You can take a second to think about it because there's been a lot of days to sift through and, and think about like which one had the most enjoyment, satisfaction, either the people you were with, the conditions, the the thing that happened because, you know. Yeah. Whatever. Um, It's like a recent year, actually, like mo- recently just riding in a huge storm. It was after... um x games and just people were trapped in aspen and and it snowed like four feet and just kept snowing and snowing and snowing and we just kept hiking the bowl like run after run with Alyssa ronick and um gretchen blyler chris hotel like just out there with your friends in the mountain having fun laughing riding nick d pow <laughs> Well, that is like one of the highlights. It should be one of the highlights for most people, you know? Yeah. And even despite all the accomplishments and, and all these like kind of crazy victories, it's really the riding that matters. Yeah. You know? Cool. Well, thank you, Trish. Thank you. <laughs> On behalf of Mark Sullivan and the Beeve, thanks for listening to The Snowboard Project. Remember, ride fast, take chances, dream big, and take action. And for God's sake, don't be a... Don't forget to support advertising free snowboarding media at patreon.com. The Snowboard Project. The The Snowboard snowboard Project. project. The Snowboard Project.